for me. To, so, watch this space. I'm not sure what to do. Virtual drinks work? I don't know. No, no. It depends if you just like if you're just on a call drinking. That's called alcoholism. But if you're actually like playing group games or something, then you could do something like that. But that that again is very down to the people attending and whatnot. Right. Okay. Well, let's just uh, put our heads together about what to do from next month. Then. So anyway, so as we were talking about earlier on, we've got uh, core updates. Uh, 2020-012 remote code execution. And I think this is Drupal 7, Drupal 8, and Drupal 9. Yeah. Um, we were chatting a bit about it earlier on, but this was very good when it's just joined. Actually, can somebody with more of a security background explain this? I'm probably the wrong person. Uh, I think the crux is that someone could upload a file to your site and it can then be ex executed as a PHP file. So they can give it the wrong file extension. So you, the normal sort of file extension detection stuff doesn't work because they can they can access it as it was uh, if it was a PHP file. And it's not just PHP. Sense. Yeah, scripts, so anything that can run on the server. It is mitigated if you, one, don't allow users to upload files, which, um, you know, is the case on some sites. <laughs> um, or two, if you have uh, security protocols across your files directory to prevent any execution going on in there. Um, I know I know we've got some uh, some scripts we run across the files directory just to make sure that doesn't happen. So um, we're pretty confident you can't exploit this at the moment. He says touch wood. <laughs> um, well, but but that said, you know, get your sites updated because there's a potential. Yeah, well, uh, flag up was critical, isn't it? Yeah. So it needs, um, it never needs never assume it's, it's all correct until you get it patched. Yeah, because I think the assumption is that it will be a PHP exploit, whereas this could actually be something else. So I actually doubt whether a lot of servers are actually protected against this. Hmm. Okay. Um, moving on, we've got. Uh, there are some module updates as well, but... Uh, oh, sorry, go on. No, no they're, they're just um, minor ones, I think. I wasn't yeah. using any of them, so... <laughs> Drupal 7 had a bunch of modules that had the same exploit that got patched, basically. Oh, I see. Yeah. That was it. Okay, well, just around the corner, we've got DrupalCon uh, Europe, 8th to the 11th of December. Um, once again, this is virtual. Um, it's going out on the um, pop-in platform, um, which was also used for um, the last DrupalCon. And wasn't it also used, Martin, uh, the, at Bad Camp a couple of weeks back as well, or a few weeks ago? It's been used by a few of the camps, yeah. Yeah, it works pretty well. Um, there is a price tag attached to this. It's not... Uh, it's not particularly cheap, but it's far cheaper than attending a DrupalCon in person. And there's a full um, lineup of talks, presentations, boffs, and so on. So go and check that uh, out. Um, now, this evening, we're joined by Martin Anderson Klutz from London. How does that work? <laughs> <laughs> London, Ontario. Yeah, I think a few years running now. I think a few years now running now. Um, the Onion has uh, kept re republishing an article about how we're the second best London. So, right. and, uh, maybe not. Maybe not. London's not that great these days. <laughs> I was going to say that's debatable. It probably yeah. uh, might win now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. I you're Ask anyone listening. in the north. Yeah, what you're listening to now is northern bias. There, yeah. Well, I, I, I spent 20 years working in London, and maybe I overdosed on it. But I, when I was last down there about a year ago, I couldn't get out of the place. I've but, spent uh, most of my life down south, so I'm technically a southerner. Sorry. <laughs> Honorary northerner if you're at Drupal Yorkshire, so that's okay. Um, so anyway, uh, welcome. Uh, Martin, now uh, Martin's the maintainer of the Smart Date module, and I was just sort of working out um, just 
doing a little bit of research earlier on for my um, introduction. So um, I just looked mine up on um, LinkedIn and realised that we had a mutual connection of Pat Gilbert. Now, I don't know if anybody remembers Pat, but Pat uh, dropped in to one of our Drupal Yorkshire meetups in Leeds uh, two or three years ago uh, when we were at the ODI building. And this is Chippy. Pat here on the right hand side. Um, that was one of those uh, beer and pizza evenings. And I think I was doing a talk that night about doing DevOps on a budget. Um, you still working with uh, with Pat there at uh, where, where, where is it you're at? Digital, I, I can't even say this. Digital, <laughs> digital echidna. echidna, exactly. Yeah, like um, digital porcupine or something. Exactly. Yep. So yeah. the the story is that the owner's brother-in-law was from Australia, and so they sat down to try and think up a, a business name, and. Um, I suspect that the availability of domain names was maybe at least partially a factor as well. Um, but uh, yeah, they went with Echidna and uh, that's what it's been for 14 years now. And uh, well, it looks like you've got quite a big team there. Um, looking at the staff page earlier on, how, how many are you all together? So officially Digital Echidna is, I want to say around 70, 75 people. Um, but we're actually in the process of merging with another local company called Northern Commerce, which is also around 70, 75 people. So the combined company is going to be, um, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 140 to 150 people, um, bringing together uh, a strong Drupal skill set on the Echidna side and then more of an e-commerce um, sort of, you know, Magento, Big Commerce, and, and a few other uh, platforms on the other side, so it's it's going to be it's going to be pretty interesting in uh, 2021 to see how those skill sets uh, come together. Interesting. And, and what kind of um, what kind of organizations are you dealing with as clients there most of the time? Um, so, you know, probably pretty common for uh, the Drupal space. We do a lot of higher ed, quite a bit of government um, and nonprofits. Uh, we've been doing quite a bit of work with sort of healthcare related. So in some cases, they might be, you know, government and related organizations, a few hospitals, um, a few other things. So those are probably our, our biggest verticals, but um, definitely being primarily focused on Drupal has also gotten us into some other things that fall outside of those verticals. Lately, I've been doing a fair bit of work on some smaller municipal sites locally. And um, <clears throat> One of the things that's been interesting about that has been um, trying to develop multiple sites out of a single template. So there, there was a little bit of discussion earlier about that. Uh, we've been trying a, a, an approach of actually having um, not multi-site, but actually forking the repo within Git. And then that way, by maintaining the, the fork structure, you can push commits from your template out to the um, the duplicated sites, the fork sites, um, but maintain any overrides so that, you know, uh, you can preserve any theme changes and some of those kinds of things. And so far that's been working pretty well. Cool. All right, well, thanks for that. Like, so without uh, further ado, if we hand the screen over to, to you, Martin, and tonight you're gonna tell us about the smart date module of which you're a maintainer. And I think from when we were chatting on Slack earlier on, you're happy to um, invite and welcome questions as you're talking along. And sure. uh, so please um, tell us all about it. All right. Uh, I think I need you to stop sharing your screen before I can share mine. Got it. Sorry. That's <laughs> okay. All right, so uh, thanks everybody for joining us for this talk about uh, Smart Date and how, as a contrib module, it can help to make Drupal's event handling even smarter. So, uh, as we already mentioned, my name is Martin Anderson Klutz. I'm a solutions architect at Digital Echidna, 
and on Drupal.org and various social platforms, I go by Manclu. So uh, one of the, the uh, main parts of this talk today is gonna be uh, really trying to do more of a hands-on demo. So I've done a fresh install of Drupal 9. You can see here, it's literally just um, installed with, with really no customizations apart from installing a couple of themes. So um, I've, I've set as the default theme, the Olivero theme, which is has been a contrib module, but will be part of Drupal in 9.1, which is gonna be out in a couple of weeks. And uh, once it's uh, stable, it, it is intended to become the default uh, front, theme, front end theme for uh, Drupal moving forward. And then on the admin side, um, I'm using uh, Jin as the um, admin theme, which is kind of, you might say an extended version of the Claro theme, which is in core, but also experimental at this stage. So just to verify here, you can see that I've only got the article and basic page. Um, so there's really nothing that's been done to that site yet to customize it. So if you wanted to do just a super basic install, it could be as simple as this. If you've got, you know, obviously Composer and Drush installed, or that installs Drush. Um, the process that I used looked more like this, or in fact, I uh, chained them all together to make a single command that I can run to refresh my demo environment um, pretty quickly. But the crux of what we're going to do today is really this simple. So um, let's flip over to our command line and, and go to composer, require Drupal smart date calendar kit. So uh, especially because I'm still running Composer 1, this is going to take a couple minutes. So while it's doing its thing, let's switch back to our presentation and get moving. So I thought I would spend a couple minutes just talking specifically about recurring events because, excuse me, while Drupal does an okay job of handling events in general, uh, recurring events in particular for D8 can be a pain point. So recurring events, um, is something that the visitors or the editors on your website are probably used to using, whether they're used to using, you know, Google Calendar, Outlook, um, Apple Calendar, and, and various other popular calendar software. The interfaces between some of those things will be a little bit different, but in terms of functionality, they're actually pretty consistent. So as we can see here, the opportunity to have events recur sort of daily, weekly, monthly, or annually. Um, you can set an interval, so every other week, every three months, every four years, those kinds of things. Um, set specific dates on which something should re uh, recur, and then also to be able to set some kind of a limit. So to say it should end on a specific date or after a certain number of occurrences. And also related to recurring uh, events is this concept of the R rule format, which is actually a data standard Google actually uses that, as I understand it, internally. So that's actually how it sort of stores and manages recurring events. I'm pretty sure Apple actually uses our rules, but maybe as more of an import-export format. Um, but it's, it's as far as I know, sort of the, the strongest um, or closest thing we would have to sort of universal standard for describing recurring events. So based on that, I thought I would spend just a couple of minutes um, talking about the structure of that, and in particular, a couple of the fields. So uh, obviously the most crucial being the frequency. So defining uh, the interval at which an event will recur, then you can set a count or, uh, count or until as basically the way of limiting it. So again, to say the number of times it'll recur or the date on which it'll stop. And then you can set the interval um, again, to, to um, set, you know, if it's weekly, how many weeks between instances and so on. Then there are more complex structures. So you could say by day of the month. So um, only allow it to fall within certain days, within certain hours, within a day, some of those kinds of things. Um, and without going into too much detail on these, I wanted to give you a sense of what an R rule looks like and how that translates into something we would describe with natural language. So um, you can see, for example, in the second one that even though how we describe it actually sounds fairly simple, Friday of the first week of the full month, um, in terms of the, the logic behind it is actually um, on a bit more of the complicated side. 
And then once you start to look at the interaction of some of those extended properties and how they interact with the different frequency values, you can see that it actually gets extremely complicated in terms of how you would define and, and leverage all of those and, and get the different elements of an R rule working together. And so uh, you begin to understand in the daytime space how it, it really becomes a rabbit hole of complexity. So you take all of the um, the R rule complexity, you can layer on time zones, daylight savings time, uh, leap years, the ability to have exceptions with re recurring dates. So you may want to reschedule a particular instance or cancel it outright. Um, layer on maybe regional formatting. So accommodating for the differences between how um, or the preferred formatting of sort of dates and times in different languages. Um, and you really start to see kind of how deep that rabbit hole goes. But fortunately, within the Drupal space, there are uh, a number of different modules that, that help to sort of mitigate that complexity. And the one that we're going to talk about today is SmartDate. So I first came up with the idea for SmartDate a few years back. I was working on a website for a local regional fall fair and um, populating some content. And as I was going through the process of entering in these, these various dates, I realized that it was extremely tedious to, to do the data entry for these. And what I started to, to realize is that by using these default uh, date formats, you actually have to manually provide 14 different pieces of information. So year, month, day, uh, hours, minutes, seconds, and then AM or PM, and then do that for both the start and the end. And I started trying to think about, well, why is it that it's so much easier when you do the same thing with popular calendar software? And it does a couple of things that, that really make that whole process easier. And, and the first and foremost is that it uses this concept of duration. So by default, it assumes that you want your uh, meetings or, or events to be an hour long. And so um, as soon as it has a start, it can automatically populate the end. And when you reschedule the start, it'll automatically change the end for you. Um, and then the other thing that it does is that it it sets as a default, not you know right now or an hour from now, but the next hour. And, and so because that aligns better with when you're typically going to schedule an event, so at you know 12 p.m. as opposed to 12, 13 p.m. and 43 seconds, it saves the editor from having to zero out things that, you know, again, is, is going to be a more typical use case. And the other thing that I'll point out with these interfaces that you'll notice is, is a, a common element are these all day checkboxes and the ability to set the events as repeating. So I started thinking about, well, how could Drupal have some of these um, same capabilities in terms of, you know, making the, the date entry easier, uh, incorporating elements like the all day checkbox, which was something we were having clients asking us for in the sites that we were building for them. And another element was that we were being asked to kind of reduce duplication in the output of some of those things. So if somebody said, well, when's the uh, Drupal Yorkshire meetup gonna be? You wouldn't typically say, oh, well, it's gonna be uh, November 19th from 1.30 p.m. to November 19th at 3.30 p.m. You'd say November 19th from 1.30 to 3.30. And so um, there are fairly custom ways to do some of those things. We were implementing it um, at the theme layer inside uh, sort of twig template files and, and doing some, some logic there. Um, but really, I started thinking about, well, if, if we're building a module to, to more intelligently handle dates, that should be part of it as well. And then uh, the last piece was really around the same time I was getting a website ready to launch and I was doing a crawl of it to see if there were particular pages with performance issues. And I was surprised to find that the page that by far had the biggest performance issue was an events archive page, which for a site about to launch basically had almost no data in it. And so I did some uh, debugging in views and I realized that the query that was being constructed for that view was, was pretty heinous in terms of the computation that the database was having to do on every row just to be able to make a comparison with sort of the current time. And so I uh, did some research, realized that in Drupal 8, the core date fields actually store um, dates and times as strings. And so that's why it has to do all of this conversion to be able to make some of those logical comparisons. And so I decided that, that there was a really good use case for a module here 
to really deliver on those those sort of three key elements of the the editor experience, making dates easy to manage, um, the performance aspect of being able to effectively manage um, dynamic information for dates and times in a way that's really performant, and then also sort of the formatting so that visitors to the site um, can see and ingest that, that data information in a way that's very intuitive. So in terms of the overall approach for the module, really tried to leverage Drupal core as much as possible. So um, Drupal does have a date range field that includes an HTML5 date time picker. And so tried to really extend and build off of that as opposed to, to starting from scratch. And as well, Drupal core uses timestamps in a variety of places. So um, things like a node creation date, when a node was last updated, when a, a user last uh, logged into the website are all things that Drupal by default stores as timestamps. And in fact, some of the formatting functions that uh, Drupal has natively actually convert dates um, from sort of a, a daytime object into a timestamp before they're formatted. And so there's lots of functionality already in Drupal to manage timestamps and being um, able to then store those in an integer field makes them, uh, again, a lot more performant for the kinds of comparison that uh, a view might need to do. And so decided to use timestamps as a way um, to really deliver on particularly the, the performance aspect of that. For handling recurring dates, I uh, really wanted to, to try and take a very practical approach in terms of how can we implement recurring dates in a way that's going to make it easy for site builders to, to include those in their views. And so tried to make the instances as the, the um, sort of the bits of the data that are directly associated with a node and then abstract off the um, sort of the, the higher level logic around the recurring values and so on. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about um, how that sort of uh, helps you as a site builder. Also wanted to make sure we had the ability to override specific instances of recurring rules. So again, either you know, reschedule or cancel. And then also provide some special formatting for uh, recurring dates. So if you were scheduling a weekly meeting that is going to go on, on for the next four years, you wouldn't want your users to come to that page and see, you know, 200 uh, weekly meetings listed there, um, there's only a, a small subset of those that are really going to be useful to them in sort of the here and now. And so try to provide a formatter that you can configure to, um, to provide sort of more meaningful, uh, narrowed down um, subsets of, of that overall set of data. Calendar integration is, is something, again, that was asked about early on after SmartDate had originally launched. Um, I think it might have even been Paul who originally suggested using full calendar view as the, um, the module for integration. And at first, it required a patch to full calendar view to be able to get the two modules working together. But then the maintainer of full calendar view was able to implement kind of a, a, a plugin system so that SmartDate can instantiate a class. And um, now the two things work together without any sort of patching necessary. So that gives um, smart date not only drag and drop support, but uh, you can sort of double click to add events. You can you know reschedule by dragging in, and we'll see more of this as we get into the demo. Um, but also because of the approach that we took for recurring dates, um, the calendar can easily display, you know, either one-time events or occurring events or a mixture of the two without, without any problems. And then the other piece that we layered on was this concept of starter kits. So um, using smart date is, um, I've tried to make it so that it's easy to use and uh, always trying to balance that um, balancing act of sort of complexity on the one hand and power on the other hand. And so I started thinking about uh, a way to provide some things that were sort of pre-configured. So someone who wanted to, to try it out wouldn't have to sort of necessarily navigate a lot of the, the sort of more complicated bits deep down in, in the various ways that SmartDate can be configured, but, but really um, get up and running with a set of what I would consider best practices. And so I developed these smarter kits as a way to either um, let you try it out the module or potentially if you're building a site where you need um, you know, an event system potentially with a calendar integrated, um, it can get you a good part of the way there um, in just a couple of minutes. And we'll again, see that in our demo as we go through. 
So um, as I say, I've, I really tried to build in as much as possible of what I would consider best practice in terms of how to con uh, configure some of these pieces. But if you use them and have some different ideas of how you think they could be better, always open to sort of um, feature requests, as well as any patches that you want to submit for any of these starter kits. But uh, returning to our demo, specifically, we were uh, working on the smart date calendar kit. So let's go back to our command line and let's just enable that. So before I move into the demo here, while that's installing, do, are there any questions, any uh, things people want to make sure we cover as we move through? That sounds like we're good. So now if we come back here and refresh the page, we can see now that when we go to add content, we can add an event here. And so let's just give this a title here. You can see that the, the date interface here has really tried to draw on some of those elements that we talked about. So you've got your duration, you've got your all day checkbox if you want your an all day event. Um, if we change the start of the event, we can see that the end is updated automatically based on the duration. We can also change the duration there, or we can manually change the end and it'll update the duration and then preserve it uh, as we continue to edit it. So let's go ahead and add a couple of additional values here. So let's stagger these a bit. Let's go 11 a.m. Let's make all day event that spans a couple of days. And let's set one to be at the end of the month. So now when we save those, Again, you can see some of the out output deduplication that we've talked about. So um, for an event that's within a day, it'll only show the date once and then the time range. If that is in um, sort of a single part of the day, so AM or PM, it'll only show um, the day part once, but will output it when necessary. And then you can see if the event actually crosses over the date, then it'll actually um, put that in there. There's an optional. Um, and configurable uh, output of what it'll, uh, like a token that'll output for an all-day event. Um, it will deduplicate these, but uh, it is more challenging to do that in, again, sort of a natural language way when the day part is in there. So let's go ahead and update our configuration uh, to something that's going to illustrate it a little better. So let's manage our display. And if we go in, Smart Date has its own uh, formats. So they're similar to um, core uh, date and time formats, but they're more granular. And we'll get to that in a second. But uh, as a quick illustration, let's just switch that to compact view and save that. Now when we switch back, you can see much more easily the um, how it will, again, reduce the time range. Um, if the uh, date range is within a month, it'll only show the month once. If it crosses over into another month, it'll show the, the date in both, but the year only once. And then obviously if this was to go December 31st to January 1st, then you'd see, you know, uh, month, day, year for both the start and the end. So uh, I think at that point, actually, maybe that's a good segue to actually look at the um, formats here. So if we go into edit one of these, you can see that they're like the core uh, date time formats in the sense that they use PHP date strings. Excuse me. Uh, except they are more granular. So uh, it separates out date and time, but then also allows you to set a more uh, compact value for events that fall on the hour. Again, it's, it's quite common in sort of natural language to um, for something that falls at, let's say, 12 noon to 
only show you know 12 p.m. as opposed to uh, showing the minutes for that. And so uh, you have the option to do that, or if you leave that empty, then you'll just get the sort of, uh, it'll use this time format universally. And the all day label um, is something you can choose to use or not. You can easily customize the separator um, between our sort of for the range as well as what to use to sort of join the, the date and time together and even uh, which of those two should come first. And again, all of these are translatable because of the fact that um, there are sort of different standards for different languages. And so you can uh, define a format and then translate it to make sure that, for example, you know, in German where they prefer to have the date first, that, that it always appears that way, even though in other languages it may be the opposite. Um, if that deduplication, for whatever reason, based on the format you're using, isn't giving you the output you're expecting, or is, is potentially even uh, hiding information that you want, you can easily turn that off. And also, when you're using time zones, um, it uh, by default will append. Um, so let me start over. If you if you set an event and give it a time zone other than the default for the site, then by default it'll put after that. Um, the time in the sort of either the user or the site default time zone to give them a sense of, okay, well, that's, it's, you know, two to three in Brazil, but, um, you know, here it's four to five as an example. But if that's not what you want, then, then again, that's something you can easily turn off. So speaking of time zones, let's actually uh, go back to our field configuration. Uh, here we go, event, manage form display. If we wanted to be able to assign time zones to the fields, the, um, the capability is sort of built into Smart Date, but it's hidden until it's really needed to, again, try and make the overall experience as intuitive and easy to use as possible. So you just have to update your widget to say date and time range with time zone. And then another feature here is that if you leave this empty, it'll, it'll provide this sort of, um, or inclusive list of all of the available time zones um, to your users when uh, they go to specify a time zone. Um, but it's probably fairly common that a site only has a subset of those that it actually needs to support. So um, we could say, let's just pick a handful of these that we want to actually go ahead and support. So if we pick a few, and then save those. When we go back and edit our event, you can see now we have our time zone widget and it only has the, the four values that we've selected. So again, uh, very simple to make that, that experience of, of managing time zones uh, much easier for your users, again, particularly if there's, there's really only a subset of those overall time zones that you really need to support. So let's see how we're doing here. I think we've covered all of that slide. Now, let's start talking about the recurring functionality. So Smart Date actually puts all of the, uh, the functionality for recurring events in a, in a sub-module. So let's go ahead and enable that. That's good. Now we need to update our field because it doesn't assume that every smart date field on the site should then be able to recur. It's really something that as a site builder, you need to tell it that it should allow that. So we'll say allow recurring dates. And smart date allows you to not specify a limit on your date, but I didn't want it to sort of, you know, keep generating instances until, you know, the server runs out of memory or your database runs out of space. Um, it, it has a default value of how far out it should generate those instances. And then it'll use a cron job to sort of uh, incrementally make sure that it has that, that number of months worth of events moving forward. Because I figured in most cases, there's probably a window where it's useful to be able to look out into the future and see the, the upcoming instances. Um, but that'll probably depend on the site and the types of recurring events that you're managing. So for events that are only you know quarterly or annually. It might be fine to um, post those out for five years for now. If you have events that recur you know every day, then it might be might only be useful to have events that are listed you know three or six months out. So um, using this capability, you can easily customize that. 
on the same screen, um, you have your defaults. So these are the core ones, current date and relative date, but it adds this next hour to, again, um, align with uh, sort of popular calendar software and how they work. And here's where you can define those uh, allowed duration increments that, that appear in here. So you can customize that list. Um, if you wanted to do something like, let's say you had a conference you were organizing that was only going to allow 45 or 90 minute sessions, you could have only those values here. So if we go 45 and 90, by not having custom in there, it would force a user to uh, use one of those values. So it would, it would basically enforce um, the duration to be just those values. And uh, it's only when you have custom in there as a token that'll allow people to uh, use things that, that don't fall in there. So again, really gives you a lot of capabilities in terms of uh, what you, you know, do or don't want to really enforce as far as how it's going to be used. But let's go ahead and save that with our uh, recurring values. And then let's go ahead and add a new event. So let's call that recurring event. Let's go ahead and backdate uh, a couple of weeks. Um, you can see it's got our default sort of days, weeks, months, or years in terms of how often that's going to recur. Um, and then depending on what you select, it'll give you this advanced menu with different options. So for something that occurs daily or weekly, it's going to give you days that you can choose. For something that's going to be monthly, you could do something like say, let's make that recur on the third Thursday, like this meetup. Um, but in our case, let's go ahead and set this to be weekly. And let's say it'll end after 10 times. So let's save that. And we can see that it has all of our dates there um, listed out individually. Um, and that's fine for a small number like this. But if you, again, start to have a larger number of events, then you're probably going to want to have uh, a display of those that's going to be uh, more useful to your users. So let's go ahead and change the display to say there's a recurring formatter um, that's again, built specifically to handle recurring dates and, and sort of the different um, considerations there. So you can have a certain configurable number of, of past and upcoming instances to show. So let's say maybe we only want to show the one more recent, but the three upcoming ones, but let's go ahead and, um, why did it do that? There we go. Let's show the next instance uh, separately. So probably the most useful bit of information to someone looking at that piece of, um, or the uh, node for that event is probably going to be, which is the next one. So we can say, let's, let's separate that one out. Um, in addition to some of the other configuration pieces. So if we go ahead and save that, and here we go. So you can see the next one is gonna be based on our schedule, November 25th. The previous one was yesterday, and then uh, the next two in December. I'll also point out that one of the more recent features in SmartDate is the ability to also configure um, those frequency values. So where I had originally built it to only handle sort of daily, weekly, monthly, or annually, again, to align with uh, popular calendar software, um, there, there was discussion around some use cases, particularly for things like an appointment calendar and so on, to be able to have uh, events that could recur hourly or by minutes. And so if we update that and save those, Zoom is always in the way. There we go. If we go to edit. Um, now we can see those, those other values. And so when you set things to recur by minutes, it, it sort of assumes that it, it, you want these things to recur consecutively. So if we change this to be every 30 minutes, you can see that it recurs, repeats every 30 minutes. Uh, in this case, we could change it to be manually um, every 15 minutes. And then now in the advanced menu, we have some options in terms of 
uh, potentially restricting when within the day um, that event can occur. So we could say, let's make that recur every 15 minutes between uh, 9 a.m. and 12. Um, if you wanted to, you could also do things like say, well, maybe we want it every 15 minutes, but um, on the 30 minute mark, we want to um, omit those. So you could say only when it falls on 0, 15 or 45. And you can see you could actually kind of quickly model out some relatively complex sort of logic in terms of uh, when those different events are going to be um, recurring. But let's go ahead and, and leave our, our weekly event for now. And then the next piece that I want to show is the uh, events calendar. So if we can go down, uh, we can see that again, the smart date calendar kit installed all of this for us. It's sort of pre-configured. Um, I like to do things like on my content views have a button that an editor can use to sort of quickly add an event. Um, so that's there. If you wanted, you could configure that to open up in a sidebar or a modal um, pretty easily in the view configuration. You can see that the events that we've put in here are already listed for us. And if we wanted to, we could do things like say, well, on the 25th, when that occurs, we actually need that one to be on Thursday. So it's gonna come up and ask us to confirm. If you don't want these confirmations, again, you can easily configure that away. Um, but in our case, let's go ahead and say that's okay. Even within the date, if you wanted to, you could drag and drop those to reschedule uh, the time or even the duration. So uh, some fairly good capabilities there. Um, and so we're on November 26th. If we double click on a specific time, you can see that it opens up to create an event, but populating at the spot where we double clicked it. Again, pretty similar to popular calendar software, but, but nice to be able to have Drupal give us um, this same kind of um, the same kind of capability. So let's just go ahead and save that. It'll bring us back to the events calendar. And now we can see that our new event is in there uh, right where we created it. So um, how are we doing for time here? I think we're doing pretty great. All right, so wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the other modules in the um, Drupal kind of date time space and um, Kind of how they compare and maybe some use cases where you might want to use different modules. So um, certainly for recurring dates, if you had used them in Drupal 7, likely you use this date recur module. Um, at its core, it's really um, a text area that, that will store an R rule and then sort of generate the instances from there. Um, the date recur module natively doesn't have a UI, but it has companion modules that they can actually give you some, um, I think more than one choice for which UI you wanna use. And um, again, because, because it started as an R rule field, um, that's really the piece that's directly associated with the node. And therefore, when you want to um, list the instances of your recurring rule, uh, you actually need to create a relationship. And so, um, it's more complex from a site building standpoint, as well as the fact that then uh, mixing, um, you know, date recur based recurring instances with uh, non recurring dates can be more complicated. Um, and then finally, for integrating date recur with calendars, often that requires patches. I believe the calendar module um, has it, but it's also in kind of a beta state, uh, as I recall. So we've already talked about smart date, uh, really designed to be um, as easy to use as possible and, and particularly by leveraging sort of UI conventions that, that editors would be used to from um, other popular calendar applications. Um, tried to make the recurring dates not only easy to use, but, but easy to, to sort of uh, site build with and to give you that uh, calendar integration out of the box. There's another module called recurring events. Um, really built, I would say, to some degree with um, registration in mind. It's, it's unlike smart date or date recur. It's not a field that you would add on to a node or, or another type of entity. Um, it really uses its own custom entities. And so, um, you know, that's definitely something to keep in mind in terms of potentially the ease of integration for doing things like listing, um, you know, recent content on your homepage as an example. 
Um, as I understand it, the UI for it is sort of deliberately unstyled. So the idea being, you know, you as kind of a site builder, a themer, um, have the, the flexibility to, to sort of mold it into exactly what you want. Um, recurring events, I would say, as far as I understand, was really the first in the, the Drupal space to, um, to implement that sort of consecutive recurring dates idea. But as we saw, um, that's in smart date now. Um, last I heard, there was no capability for managing time zones with recurring events, but uh, definitely possible that um, that's something that will be added in the future. There's a newer module called Bookable Calendar. It's actually to some degree based on Smart Date. It actually lists Smart Date as a dependency and then uses um, the UI in terms of date creation. Um, again, built specifically for registration and also uses custom entities. Um, last I checked, it's also very much a work in progress. So um, potentially, if you're interested in using it, it might be a good time to look in the issue queue, potentially put in some feature requests in terms of how you think that module should look. Uh, certainly the conversations that I've had with that module's maintainer, uh, he seems very responsive and open to uh, different approaches. Sort of, sort of visually um, compare how these different modules work. Uh, again, the, the key difference between smart date and the recurring date field um, being which set of data is, is more directly associated with the node and, and really tried to, um, to have smart date manage that data in a way that, that makes it as easy as possible for site builders. Um, for recurring events, there's, there's no association with nodes at all, but uh, the flip side of that is that you get the registration piece. And again, bookable calendar, uh, fairly similar from an architectural standpoint. And since registration really is sort of a key consideration in terms of uh, potentially which module you want to go with, I also thought it would be worth talking to some degree around um, different approaches to registration itself. So um, does the registration strictly need to be in Drupal? So, um, you know, this Drupal users group is, as well as ours in London and a few other places use uh, Meetup instead of Drupal as the actual registration mechanism. Um, other sort of camps and conferences will use Eventbrite or various other um, sort of purpose-built um, registration applications. And so um, that's definitely a perfectly valid way to solve um, the need for registration for your events. Um, for simple cases, you may be able to just use the web form module. So there is a there is an event registration demo submodule for web form when you install it, and you may find that using that and sort of tweaking it to meet your needs may give you everything that you need for, again, a, a fairly simple registration mechanism tied to your events. For more complex use cases, and particularly if you do decide that the registration uh, absolutely has to be within Drupal, you can look at the ones that we've talked about, so recurring events or the bookable calendar modules. Um, but the most robust uh, modules, for whatever reason, seem to like three-letter acronyms. So you've got bookable entities everywhere and events registration, which I'm not sure why it's RNG, but it is, um, as well as the booking and availability management tools module. I don't personally have a lot of experience with either of those three, um, but if anybody, um, you know, present has some experience with those and, and wants to talk, um, you know, at the end about those, then uh, definitely interested in, in hearing any firsthand experience. So to sum things up, um, Smart Date was, was really built to address those core problems of the editor experience and, and making that sort of intuitive and aligned with uh, popular calendar software uh, from a site speed uh, performance to make sure that we're uh, storing and working with dates in, in a way that's uh, going to give our websites good performance and then uh, making the output of those, um, you know, sort of uh, aligned with the expectations of users even in different languages. And then along the way, tried to identify wherever possible how we could make life easy for site builders. So um, drop-in functionality for recurring dates, interactive calendars, and time zone handling. And so with that, I will open it up for questions or comments. Brilliant, well, thank you, Martin. One of Thank the best you, Martin. <laughs> Thank you. The online version, that's for sure. Right. <laughs> um, I've got a few questions. Um, okay. 
So that there was a module called partial date for Drupal 7, which did some fuzzy date stuff. Um, I just thought I'd mention it because there might be some stuff in there that um, that you might find useful for ideas. So I don't know if kind of exactly what it did, but you could choose parts of dates where you were missing elements of it. So that was quite a cool module that I used to use, um, but it never got ported. So I haven't haven't touched that for five plus years. Yeah, I know there was a, an issue that we had recently. I think it was something to do with date comparisons and um, oh, it was it was for recurring dates and the ends on field um, because if you just put the date, then PHP would do what it always does and assume that you mean that date at 12 a.m., which means yeah. that if that was the date of the last event, it would sort of trim off that the one on that date. And so um, added a little bit in there to say if it's for the ends on filter specifically um, to, and there's no uh, time provided to set that as basically like a second before midnight and any that way any event on that date would would uh, be included. Um, but I've also seen there was a recent issue around um, like a filter and a view that was the same kind of an idea of saying like if somebody just puts the date in don't assume that they mean 12 a.m. because if it's like you know, up to that date, then they probably want things for that date as well. Um, so yeah, I'll definitely take a look at that. That's uh, that's a good suggestion. Is, you said you had uh, other questions? Uh, so many. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, I mean, so it's uh, it's a really great module. It looks really powerful. Um, you kind of touched on fieldable entities and I just wondered, is there a is there a roadmap for that? Because if we could uh, kind of assign attended or cancelled or that kind of thing to each instance, that would be very powerful. Um, so is there a, a roadmap for that kind of going forward? Tony, can so I then, just um, yeah. step in there? Yeah. You might want to demonstrate the instance management as well uh, on the back of Tony's question, because I don't think you covered that. That's true. So if I go back to, let's go to our current event. Um, so there is the capability to manage events. So you can see it's showing us this one is rescheduled. So it's italicized. We could say, let's cancel that one, remove it and it'll strike it through. So at a glance, you can sort of scan down and see which ones have been altered and which are still using uh, their defaults. Um, yeah. But to your point about making them fieldable, that's that's definitely a piece that is is I would say high priority on the roadmap. I, I don't, excuse me, necessarily have a concrete um, idea of when that'll be available because I'm also um, trying to think through some some uh, nuances in terms of the overall approach. So again, trying to sort of. Uh, balance those ideas of, of what's the most sort of powerful and flexible and what's going to be um, the least complicated and, and easiest to maintain. Um, so everything from assuming that these instances should be um, sort of a completely custom entity that can be fieldable to saying, um, is there a way to define a relationship to um, entities that could be defined elsewhere. So yeah. you could say maybe associate them with a node or associate them with a taxonomy term or with something completely custom that you build yourself. Um, that is potentially more, um, more flexible. There's a lot more things that you can do, but then it's potentially more complicated to get set up. And so really trying to balance out some of those ideas of, um, you know, can we have something that's that's sort of easy and quick to set up, but then also, you know, if you wanted to, you could you could take in a in a much more complicated direction. If I can sort of balance out those ideas, that's that's to me kind of the sweet spot that I'd like to to try to keep the module oriented with. Sounds amazing. Um, and yeah, I can can see the problem there. Both both kind of got their own use cases. Sure. Um, other questions? Um, and that the, the other one that I had was that um, 
kind of ha how well it plays with the date module date. So whether you could use both of them in a view or a calendar. Um, so if you mean like the core date time or date time range field? Yeah, so if we had some um, some smart dates and some core dates in a, in a site, could we use them together in a view or in a calendar? Uh, so it's an interesting question. The, um, fundamentally, they store dates in different formats. So if you wanted to do, let's say, a chronological listing, that's a mixture of the two. Uh, there might be some challenges there. There's, there's potentially some ways that could be mitigated. Smart date uh, actually does work with core date time and, and especially date time range fields. So let's say you have a legacy site that's built using those fields and you wanted to just use the smart date widget and output formatter, you could definitely do that. Um, so install the module, but just um, change the, the sort of widget and display formatter to use the, the smart date elements. Um, so theoretically, that's maybe a bit of like, it's not directly answering your question, but that's, uh, potentially a way you could you could get some of the benefits of smart date and um, you know potentially mix together with with non smart date uh, data um, there is probably a way to get those working together again because the the process of, of converting between a timestamp and sort of a Drupal core uh, date date time object is is fairly trivial to do um, but certainly if you were doing things like a database sort um, mixing those is, is probably a bit uglier. So um, I'd probably have to have sort of a more concrete like example to play with before I could give you a definitive ex uh, answer, but I feel like- it sounds, So it sounds like it's a better idea to use these dates everywhere if you're, if you're using them somewhere. I mean, that's what I would do, but yeah. <laughs> I, I'm obviously a little biased, so. Yeah, maybe. I <clears throat> I would drop everything date related and move over to smart date. It just it's just better. So does it it does have uh, views filter support then? Does it? It does. Um, one of the pieces that's uh, still being resolved is having um, granularity support in the exposed filter. So in um, the date field for for D seven, you could say. Um, you know, show me all of the events happening this month. And that was fairly trivial to set up. Yeah. Um, Drupal core still doesn't, there's, um, there's a longstanding issue to resolve that capability. And I'm optimistic that once that's fixed, um, again, because we really tried to leverage as much of core as possible, that uh, we'll have that granularity capability um, for smart date. Um, but that, that being said, I noticed recently that, that someone has identified a completely different issue as a blocker for that one. So at this point, I'm a bit up in the air as to whether or not I should continue to wait for Drupal Core to solve that issue versus potentially look at something that's a more custom implementation directly with um, Drupal. Because as I understand it, the, the new blocker issue is related to, um, I think it's a combination of time zones and daylight savings time. And so, because I think it's also therefore related to the fact that um, core is um, storing times as strings. And so I'm hopeful that if I did a more custom implementation, but really focusing on the timestamps that smart date uses, that it could be easier to implement. So um, yeah, that's also on my roadmap, but that's, um, there, are, there are existing sort of filters that you can use in views for sure. Yeah. Um, just just following on from that quickly, uh, what about search um, support? So things like search API or the solar, solar servers? Yeah, so um, I believe that um, natively search API should treat them as timestamps the same way that um, if you were storing, again, your node creation date or your you know, user last logged in date, it would, it would index those as timestamps. It should be able to do the same. Um, if you needed something else, there's probably other ways to do it, but, um, you know, um, 
if like you run across a, an issue, by all means, like open a, a <laughs> ticket in the issue queue and we can go from there. I think if it's a timestamp in solo, you can pretty much cut it however you want. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's great. Thanks. Oh, no problem. Martin, you mentioned um, near the end of your talk about some of the possible registration bookings uh, sort of angles. And you, you, you mentioned three modules known by their um, BEE, RNG and BAT in terms of somebody wanted to enlarge on what they're all about. But I can, I can give you a little bit of an overview on that. Um, in terms of heritage, you would group together BAT and BEE in the same family. Um, RNG is different. Uh, B double, uh, sorry, BAT is uh, is actually a library. So it's, as well as being, you know, done for Drupal, it's also downloadable on GitHub and can be used with other ecosystems and so on. And uh, it stands for Booking and Availability Management Tools. What it does is actually deals with the idea of whether a thing has been booked or not. So we could be talking about hotel rooms, for example. And it's interesting, the BAT module would, uh, was born out of a Drupal distribution called Roomify, which was built entirely for doing apartment and hotel bookings. Um, it's a developer's solution. It's not easy to work with, certainly not for a site builder like me. Um, it, it's, it's a targeted at a, at a higher level developer. BEE stands for Bookable Entities Everywhere. That puts a site builder's front end on BAT. Um, I've uh, experimented with it. I, I still found it a bit too abstract, a bit too up in the clouds for um, you know my, my kind of use cases and so on. But it's that's what it's for and what have you. Now RNG, you asked, you know, you said what's what does RNG stand for? I can tell you that. Actually, <laughs> there's only hardly anybody knows. It, it stands for roles and groups, and it's nothing to do with bookings. That's just. It was originally designed as a booking application for roles and groups. Um, so that's how it got the, the RNG uh, name. And that, that, that's why that's kind of stuck over the years. But I'm, along with Darren, that's joined us from Australia, I'm very interested in the, uh, the registration side of things. Um, in fact, I think the registration terminology is just a bit too developerish. I think it should be bookings and I'm personally I, I can't wait for smart bookings and, <laughs> and I'm wondering when it's going to happen really. Um, talk about it. Yeah so it's definitely been been um, something I've been thinking about for a few months in terms of it really being a piece that um, I'd like to I'd like for it to be as easy as we saw for the calendar um, for somebody to say, okay, well now, as you say, I want bookings. So, you know, whether it's uh, smart date bookings or, or something else to be able to potentially have uh, one of these starter kits that you could install. And then you've got a working, if on the simple side implementation that you can then sort of, you know, add complexity to and, and make, um, you know, more tweak to your specific sort of business needs. Um, I did look at the at RNG in particular. Um, I think the challenge there, as I understand it, it sounds like it has a new a new uh, maintainer for this uh, 3.0 branch, and um, it sounds like he's um, passionate about about trying to sort of uh, get this working again, especially that new branch. Um, I will say the last time I tried it, it's, it, you know, as you said, it, it was very complex to set up. You have to define, you know, like entities and bundles and a bunch of different things before you can even sort of get the basics of it set up. Um, and so maybe there's, there's kind of a, you know, RNG smart date starter kit that you could install that would create the instances 
um, or the entities for the instances and then pre-configure RNG to be associated with those is definitely an approach that I've considered. I mean, um, as you've probably may have already gotten this sense, you know, my, my appetite is definitely not to, you know, uh, reinvent everything that's that's already uh, been implemented in Drupal and, and wherever possible, if there's a, a robust existing solution, I'd rather leverage that. Um, the uh, bookable calendar is another one that, that I find pretty interesting. I, I haven't had a, a lot of time to, to play around with that one myself, but um, but definitely it sounds like there's the potential there for um, for that to be, uh, you know, potentially another way to use smart date in, you know, that kind of a, of a bookings context. But, uh, but as I say, I do like, I like the idea of being able to associate fieldable entities with instances because it, it potentially solves a number of different use cases. So the bookings being one, but the idea of being able to associate different, you know, either data or metadata with a particular instance. So if it's, um, you know, each, each month you're gonna have a different uh, presenter and, and presentation that they give, then to be able to associate, you know, um, that user data, the, um, you know, maybe it's the title and description of their talk and some of those kinds of things um, in different ways to, to the specific instance. And, and obviously that could, could leverage uh, as well into, um, you know, the bookings type solutions. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So. See, I've, I've often found it easier in the past to sort of create a single sign-on solution between the site and like ticket solve or something than to actually build a booking platform into Drupal. Uh, just just in terms of the cost point of view, really, because you know there's so much more than the clicking a booking button that you have to think about in terms of booking and maintaining an event system. So yeah, totally agree. And I, I think there will always be you know use cases that are complex enough that it, it makes way more sense to to use a you know a booking platform that is purpose built to, to handle yeah. all of the you know various pieces around that, um, but I do think there are times where having something that's um, that's limited in functionality but easier to integrate, uh, there's probably a use case for that too. So, brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you, Martin. Have we got any uh, any last questions in the room for Martin in particular? No. Okay, well, let's just uh, move forward. Mic's off. Just anybody got anything else to bring up? Anybody got anything interesting they're working on at the moment that they want to share with us? Anybody stuck with a problem that would appreciate some uh, help or, or pointers on? Just uh, shout out, please. They're all amazing developers. They don't need <laughs> more, more kind of a case of where do you even start with that question? <laughs> but do you remember a while ago I was talking about uh, Hashbang code and the fact that the the listing pages were all messed up, like they had different different templates yeah. coming through. I solved it at the weekend. <laughs> uh, finally found out what was going on. Um, and yeah, it's it's really stupid, but there's a bug in Drupal. So, uh, and I've actually, uh, I've actually got a patch in to try and solve it as well. So, if you create a, a feed like a normal RSS feed, uh, but instead of, uh, but you use the the teaser format to generate the the output of that feed. So, you know, in the sort of generating a node as a teaser output inside the feed. If you generate that feed first, the teasers will get rendered in the default uh, default template for Drupal, so that when you come to register or re render them in the, your normal template, it'll pick up the cache version of that, which is the old, you know, the default template and show that instead. If that makes sense. <laughs> um, so basically if you've got an RSS feed and you've got that same kind of problem, then, uh, then yeah, have a look at your feeds. Uh, you might you might be finding that your your template is being cached weirdly. I'll try and find the the issue I've got because uh, it might be interesting for you. 
I didn't actually solve it in the end. It was it was somebody else that solved it, um, but I hadn't been committed to code because there wasn't a test for it. So I ended up just writing the test. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I felt good to I've, solve it. I th I've got a, a non Drupal question if I can just put it in there. A um, couple of meetups back, we had Oliver with us who was telling us about Tailwind CSS. Well, I got a, a small job just for a, a, a brochure site, four page job recently from a, um, a lady. And I decided I'd, I'd turn the clock back 20 years and build a static site for by hand, <laughs> which I haven't done for 20 years. And I've got no idea how to make a contact form work. <laughs> I, I, I used to do this with um, uh, a Perl script called uh, Form Mail, which was available from Matt's script archive back in the day. I don't really want to do any PHP on this site. A couple of reasons. I'm, I don't know much about that, but you know, I just want to go have a moment of going back to basics really so what's the what's the best way forward to in terms of getting a, a contact form to work make it send an email to somebody embed it from somewhere else that's cheating <laughs> no it's not you can that's still cheating. so you i'm in a purist moment i'm going back to basics all right <laughs> what, what are you saying christopher I was you could uh, not just because i work with you but uh it's, it's one of the two. It's you're going to code it or you're going to embed it from somewhere else. Uh, I've used one and I can't remember what the heck it's called. It's something free and uh, provided you're not concerned about the privacy of your contact forms communications, I suspect it's okay. Right. <laughs> I mean, potentially you could look at um, Netlify, which is like a hosting platform designed for static sites. There's a free tier there. I have and, been about that actually. Yeah. Yeah. So they have a, a forms capability there um, that if you're hosting the site on Netlify, you can use um, Netlify forms. They, there's even like a they have like a Netlify CMS you can use for headless applications. Um, but for a very simple site, that's definitely something I'd, I'd no, it's totally check simple. out. Yeah. Four page of four pages of text. It's, uh, okay. Take another look at Netlify then. Yeah. Thank you. But you've got your own server, aren't you? You wouldn't be better if you were sticking it on that since you've got it. So, sorry, Daniel Watts. Well, yeah, pick me up. I said you've got your own server. Would you not be better off just sticking it on that? Because you've already paid. Well, I've, I've, got, I've got two or three. It's um, on the one hand, I've got a, what I normally use for sort of small business websites that want email is just a, a you know, a cPanel type thing. Um, which, which works well where, you, where your client needs email as well. Um, for, for most of my school clients, they don't need email because that's provided by the authority. So I, I use sort of cloud hosting for, for those which um, don't... Yeah, it, for, it, for doing contact forms there, I have to set up something like Mandrill or, or SendGrid or they just the emails just don't arrive. Um, so... You could, I believe you can edit and style Google Forms if you wanted to embed one of them, but I don't know. Those are your options. You embed it or you make it yourself. Uh, or you get someone else's code and you pray that you don't get hacked. Well, I mean, doing PHP mills dead. PHP mills easy peasy, isn't it? I just want to avoid it, that's all. I wouldn't know. I've not used anything outside of Drupal to send an email in like five years. Well, it's 20 years for me. Well, not 20 years for Drupal, but 20 years since I built a static site. Crazy. 20 years. PHP oh. Miller does seem to be still in active development. It's got Sorry, what's that, Christopher? PHP Mailer does still seem to be in active development on GitHub. It's yeah, I think I think Swift Mail actually pulls it in, doesn't it? PHP Mailer? Or, or there's another... There is a Drupal module that relies on PHP Mailer. Uh, there's a few actually, yeah. Uh, commerce actually, your love of your life, Drupal Commerce. 
There was a dependency on Swift Mailer. Not sure why that's my uh, love of my life. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Tailwind, by the way, very good. Liking it. I'll Liking get on with it. I'm still not. Yeah, you were saying that, yeah. <laughs> still not I'm convinced. convinced. I'm, uh, I don't know whether I'm convinced yet. I think uh, this brochure site I've been working on, I used a bit of help. I used a, uh, some external software called Pine Grow, which just gives you that sort of half code, half visual type environment, which I think can be helpful. Um, but it's, you know, a nicely styled site, looks good. Yeah, Not it's this, this thing of Im embedding colors into HTML and that kind of thing kind of is in counterintuitive to me versus um, the way that c cascading style sheets are set up. Oh, yeah, I mean, it just does away with style sheets. It's, uh, you've got to rethink how you do everything, haven't you? Yeah. Um, but... You don't need style sheets with it. That's just a simple fact. You don't. Well, doesn't it install its own style sheets? And you just well, you've got you've got you've got one style sheet, which is huge. It's like five megabytes or something. Um, you then use your utility classes when you write in the HTML, and then you stick it through Purge CSS, which eliminates all of the style sheet that you're not using and gives you something quite minimal. So yes, there's one style sheet, but it's you don't do anything to it. It, it just it pre-exists. Yeah, well, in theory, you could edit it. But... You, you wouldn't, though. There's just absolutely no need. It's got literally everything that ever existed for CSS is in it. Everything. Right, so it's death by CSS class again, then, I'm taking it. Well, you put it through post CSS before go to production and then you, you get it down to you know the absolute basics yeah if you if you used it in full um i don't think you'd have very good results but uh, no it's been good liked it um i think it opened my eyes going back into just hard coding stuff and actually in so many ways uh using something like drupal by the time you sort of bashed out your own personal little distribution sort of thing that you turn to every time. Uh, something like Drupal is just far easier in the site building stage, but it comes with it the long-term maintenance obligations. Um, whereas hard coding even a four page site is actually quite an undertaking. It takes, takes far longer than I remembered but once it's deployed, that'll be it, fire and forget. Very much. Very much, yeah. Odd update here and there. But, uh, yeah, it's been, been interesting. I've, uh, I've just thought of one, actually, which, is, um, which I'm a bit stuck on, which is whether anybody is successfully importing and exporting crop data um so importing and exporting nodes and paragraphs and and files um the one thing that i can't do at the moment is get crop data to move across and because um because the uuids change then i'm not able to just dump and import a database table has anybody kind of had any success with doing that how are you uh, uh, migrating the data? Uh, trying lots of different ways. So default default content um, does 99% of what I want to do apart from that one, one thing. Hmm. Um, uh, there's a content uh, synchronization model, uh, module as well. Um, so ideally, I'd want it to import from code. Tony, have you looked at the entity share module? Pretty sure you can move uh, crop data between um, 
sites with that on the basis that the content type data structures between one site and the other are the same. Entity share. Yeah. I'll give that a look. So if you're using default content, then what's your use case here? You just, is it to deploy some content as code? Um, so several things. So what one thing is to have a, um, a template site um, to, to start to start from. Yeah. But also to rapidly set up dev, dev sites from um, a full set of content without having to kind of migrate databases and all that kind of thing. Yeah, so so I'm I'm kind of ninety nine percent of the way of being able to install an entire site with all its content, but <laughs> crop is um, crop data is eluding me at the moment. Just give me two minutes to fire up D then, and I'll give you a definitive answer on that. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> does uh, so does deploy or what's the other one content? Not, not deploy content, uh, default content and content sync. If they've got hooks, you might be able to hook into them and and trigger some sort of secondary import as you copy the data in. Yeah. But that's a, an if. <laughs> <laughs> so look, I've got the module here. To silence. <laughs> um, nearly with People you. actually doing work. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm nearly with you. I'm nearly with you. Yes, it looks like the for default content that it triggers an an event. So you might be able to listen to the event dispatcher and, and sort of trigger it that way. Uh, might I've never tried it so. Yeah. <laughs> Can I share screen a minute? Please Go do. Or do you need permission to do that? Um, no, I can do it. Or I should be able to. Okay, we're there. Right, you seeing how the channel? Yeah. Yep. Okay, and uh, just go to what my use case is here. This would be for a school website where you've got a group of schools that are related to each other. In the UK, that would be something that we call a multi-academy trust or a federation in the case of smaller primary schools where you know the, you might have three or four schools managed by their same head teacher and they have a need to share content between sites take the example of a policy document for example which is common to to all all the sites in the group it can be created at one site and then syndicated to the other sites so that's my particular use case. Now I'm using a, a module called Entity Share for that. So if I just look at a, a piece of content, a regular piece of content, um, I've stuck in the form display um, a Boolean here, which is syndicate with affiliated schools. So that's just a field which then links into, you can link that into views, which content is syndicated and, and so on. But also it can be picked up by the entity share module. So um, uh, a, a related school 
can then go into content and fetch syndicated content from a parent site if we if we use a parent child type relationship a hub and spoke relationship yeah well it will work one to one as well but i've kept it simple just with a, a hub and spoke now for my use case that's just about bringing content across together with entity re, uh, relations whether they're images or taxonomies or related content but it's called entity share because it allows you to share entities. So if we look at the configuration here for um, syndicated content, it's got this concept called channels. So on the one hand, your different content tapes are channels, whether we're talking about basic pages, job vacancies, or menu items media items whatever but then equally we can create a channel for importing crop data or group data or settings or paragraphs or yeah whatever so it, it may not solve your problem but um it's well worth having to play with that uh certainly have a look if you find that it, it, it kind of looks promising but doesn't do quite what you want it to do, then you might want to look at using it in conjunction with the JSON API extras module, which allows you to perform all sorts of overrides to the the shares. So for example, my um, situation where I want um, basic pages to be um, syndicatable, actually I don't want images to get syndicated because the uh, a school will want to customize the syndicated content with their own images of their own school pupils in their own uniforms. So if I want, I can go in and create a, um, an exclusion on this particular entity type to synchronize everything to do with that bundle, except maybe cover images, related media, and in this case, related content as well, but bring everything else over. So it's quite a powerful combo. It's, it's pretty good. Have a look. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, dive into that. Stop sharing. There you go. So, Thanks for that, guys. Uh, December, we've got a diary date. There's, there's a, it's in the calendar. But we normally go for a pint, don't we? So... Um, uh, maybe let some of that on that out on Slack and decide what we're going to get what we're going to do for December. Uh, and in the meantime, um, unless there's anything else, can I just thank Martin again for flying in from uh, London, Darren flying in from uh, Australia, uh, where Ralph flying in from Bavaria, Christopher, where are you? That looks like a Scandinavian surname to me. It's a Scandinavian surname, but I'm a Canadian ah. in France. So you're in France, Scandinavian. <laughs> yes. Wow. Well, thanks for our international visitors to Drupal Yorkshire. And um, brilliant. See you next time, guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Martin. Cheers. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, cheers. <laughs>